Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story, DM got disciplined, final written warning, was sacked because he didn't listen to me. The second story, client asked to disable all services and I left him without phone, cable, and internet. The third story, the neighbors did not like the piles of snow on our site and were told to remove it. I did exactly as much as I had. The first story. Take direction from a 19-year-old deputy shop manager in a role literally revolved around handling cash because it's cheaper to pay their wage than an adult with more experience? Okay, enjoy your losses. Background. So in the UK, bookmakers or betting shops are notorious for their illegal employment antics, and it literally just gets ignored. Probably because the billion pound industry is able to pay its way through any legal obligations or serious allegations. Staff turnover is incredibly high, as most will just stick it out until they manage to get a better offer. Not a nice place to work, you're the most basic of low-level vessels the company drives through, slave labor for minimum wage. They will hire literally anyone that's old enough, 18 plus here in the UK, and the usual progression is from cashier, to assistant manager, to deputy manager, to shop manager. Now, the goal of the company is to have one shop manager, one deputy manager, and the rest assistant managers. Cashiers are basically assistant managers in training, and it's imperative that cashiers are trained up to become assistant managers as quickly as possible, usually within three months, though this can differ slightly dependent on the company. The reasoning behind this is because assistant managers and above can manage a shift and are trained in all aspects of cash handling, banking, profit reports, etc., and therefore able to work alone. A cashier has to work with a superior. They give the most common role an attractive title, assistant manager, probably to make young naive workers feel important. It looks good on a CV, or a resume for our American Redditors, and it also gives the company an easy scapegoat when money goes missing, bets are incorrectly settled and subsequently paid out, bets are taken for above the allowed amount, etc. You get the picture. It's usual practice to work a 12 to 14 hour shift without a break, despite this being illegal. It's also usual practice for someone to work alone, even at night, unless it's a particularly busy shop. I've witnessed on multiple occasions pregnant staff members being forced to work alone until 10 p.m., despite this also being illegal. So, you can imagine that the absolute main priority is for the company to make as much money as possible from open to close. There are a lot of corrupt aspects to the role, way too many to get into, but basically you're trained to follow hundreds of different security procedures to avoid losses that could potentially be avoided. If anything ever went wrong, like a bet was incorrectly worked out, no matter how many correct procedures you follow, you'll always be to blame. There's always some way to twist it to make it your fault. Too many mistakes and you're out. That's it. Multiple rules and practices that contradict each other to a level of corruption I didn't know existed in the UK. There was literally a rule that you can never leave the counter unattended when there are customers in the shop. Yet it was regular practice for an assistant manager to work an open until close shift, 8am to 10pm alone, during which time we're of course expected to manage any busy periods at the counter restock betting slips and pens, offer hot drinks, attend to customer toilets, empty the machines of money towards the end of the night, etc. Forget toilet breaks or lunches. Oh, and there was of course a rule of not eating behind the counter. Anyway, the systems they use settle 95% of bets automatically after you translate them into the system. 5% of bets need manual translation or calculations, either because the bet was put on early before we had the info in the system, the bet was too complicated or didn't make sense. The bet was on something foreign, or the odds differed from what the customer wrote on their slip to what was in the system at the time of placing the bet, etc. When a payout is over a certain amount, like £500 or lower if manually settled, you have to check it with the security team. We have a phone number to call. Give them the slip number, they double check it, give the go ahead to pay out. Likewise, when a customer places a bet, if the potential returns exceed a certain limit, different limits depending on what the bet was on, like horse racing, football, boxing, etc you would need to get permission before placing. In 2015, I at 24 years of age was taken on by one of the companies as an assistant manager, as I had already had three years experience at another bookmakers as an assistant manager from being 18, with another couple roles in between. So I was told the plan was to fast track my training from cashier to AM. Fine by me, it was only an extra 20p per hour, but it meant I could get more overtime. The starting wage for me as a 24-year-old cashier was 6.70 per hour, which went up to 6.90 per hour as an AM after training. In the UK, workers between the ages of 18 and 20 are entitled to less of a minimum wage. 
At the time, I think this was $5.30 per hour, so as a company that exploited every possible avenue of saving money, the younger workers were often made deputy managers and shop managers very quickly, due to cheap labor. The younger workers again were obviously favored for overtime, etc. This came with its problems, of course. Experienced staff could easily identify a dodgy or ambiguous bet, manually settle quite easily, and work out returns in their head, whereas the younger superiors made lots of mistakes, leading to losses, of course. The MC My first week I was being trained by my 19-year-old superior, when a monitored customer wanted to place a large bet. Monitored customers were bigger spenders that are given nicknames, and their bets flagged in the system to keep track of wins and losses. This bet was a four-fold accumulator on foreign sporting events, so the details and odds weren't in the system. The bet was for £1,000 with the potential returns of £16,000. I was able to quickly work the returns out in my head, but as my superior was about to immediately place the bet without getting security clearance, I quickly exclaimed that the bet would exceed the security limit, and asked why she wasn't calling for clearance. She looked at the slip, laughed and said, oh no, don't worry, the returns are only about £4,000, so that's fine if he's betting £1,000. The customer hearing this jumps in to say she was wrong, and to double check it, as he didn't want it settling incorrectly. I advised DM that I worked out to be more like £16,000, and offered a call through for her, but she places the bet anyway. So when it came to translating the bet, I wasn't going to translate it in my name, without getting security clearance, so I called them anyway gave them the slip number, and advised of the potential returns. After a couple of minutes, the security agent asks who took the bet without getting clearance, and I explain it was the deputy manager of the shop. They instruct me to contact our area manager to discuss, as by this time, two of the selections had already won. I hang up and explain this to the DM, who says she'll call the area manager, huffing like I'd obviously created a fuss over nothing. So, she gets through, explains that she took a bet from monitored customer Bob, and that even though the returns were only £4,000 off a £1,000 stake, the new girl, me, had phoned security, who then told us to contact him, as two selections had already won. After a few seconds, the DM passed the phone over to me, with a victory smile on her face. The area manager comes on and patronizingly advises me to listen to DM, and explains that I only need to call security when the payout limit exceeds those noted on the red chart. Like, how hard can it be? It's right there on the red chart, OP. I obviously peeved, and knowing full well the returns way exceeded the £5,000 limit, just obediently replied, oh, I thought the returns worked out higher than that. Sorry to bother you and the security team. The final selections weren't due to play until around 3am our time, so the next morning on my way to work, I check out the results on my phone. Both won. Never have I ever walked into a room with such an SH eating grin on my face as I did that day. The DM wasn't in, but the shop manager instead, same age as me at the time, a look of thunder on her face. I joined her behind the counter, and she immediately starts to interrogate me on this bet, asking why I took it without getting security clearance, obviously not noticing that the bet was actually taken by the DM, and assuming it must have been me, being the newbie. Such satisfaction came from the following events. I'm yet to match this level of satisfaction I felt to this day. I gladly explained it was in fact the DM that had taken the bet without clearance, despite my warning of the potential returns exceeding the security limit. I went on to explain that I was worried enough to call security myself, upon attempting to translate the bet, as the odds weren't in system, and that they had directed me to contact the area manager. Getting more flustered, the shop manager demands to know what the area manager said, and I again happily explained that I didn't know, as the DM called him to explain before passing the phone to me, and then that the area manager made it clear I was to follow my DM's instructions, and that I only needed to contact the security team if the payout exceeded the red chart limit, and that I had apologized at the time, that I must have worked it out incorrectly. Adding on at the end, that so my initial calculations must have been right after all, I got it to 16 whatever, only 100 pounds off. So turned out the DM got disciplined, final written warning, was sacked within a year. The shop manager got a telling off, the area manager is still there apparently, and I left within 8 months. Unfortunately, the joy that comes from winning is often lost to those with gambling addiction, so while there's no doubt Bob would have been happy with this win, it didn't cover the 50,000 pounds he lost that week always chasing losses, and it's particularly common in UK bookmakers to be under pressure, to direct problem gambling to the relevant support, and be under additional pressure from the same people to encourage our regular customers with hot drinks and biscuits and free bets. The next story is, you'd like to cancel your services because you haven't given me any time to actually investigate your complaint? Okay, sir. So, about five years ago, I was working for a cable slash home phone slash ISP company in a support for a frontline staff role. Part of this was faking being a supervisor, so the actual supervisors don't have to be verbally abused. Garbage system, I know, but what can you do? Well, I get a call from a frontline person, 
telling me this guy, let's call him Kyle, has asked to speak to someone about his three rental properties. I take the call and get on the phone with the guy. Me. Hi there. Thanks for choosing Corporate Drone Speak Intensifies. Kyle. Yeah, you said that I wouldn't have to pay for long distance on these three accounts? Me. Oh, well, let me go have a look at the notes on the accounts and... Kyle. No, you'll cancel my services at all three places. Me. I just need to look at the notes written on your account to... Kyle. No, you won't. If this is the service you're providing, just cancel them all. Begin malicious compliance. I need to make sure he's in fact the guy who can cancel these services at all three accounts. I ask him when he would like the services to stop. Kyle, why are you still asking me things? Immediately. Me, okay sir, I just want to make sure you're asking me to cancel all services. Phone, cable and internet. Kyle, series of swears. Yes, all three services at all three places. Now, I should point out that it was pretty close to midnight, and these places being rental properties on a Friday night probably had people living there. Also, it didn't seem that he lived at any one of them. So I went about going through each of the three accounts and shut down the services, the phone, the cable, and the internet. Now, before anyone says, oh, you took their phone away, that's dangerous, well, you can plug a phone outlet into anywhere, and even if it doesn't have service, you can still call emergency services. I went through and told the system to shut everything down. It also gives us the option to immediately stop the services from working. So I told it yes. Now, this meant that everything stops at the properties at once. Everything immediately. Watching TV? Not anymore. Looking at memes? Nope. Oh, were you making a phone call? Not anymore. I can only imagine the series of panicky texts and cell phone calls that guy had that evening because everything was shut off. The next time I was at work, I checked the notes on these closed accounts, only to find that the tenants had called in and were told the services were cancelled, followed by notes from an actual supervisor, because if you get loud enough, the real soups have to do their job. That said, after reviewing the call Kyle had with me, they felt I did exactly what the customer had asked, and there was nothing else we would do. Turns out Kyle was mad at me for following his directions, and then got his tenants to call him enraged after midnight about how nothing they had was working. The last story is... Neighbor disputes over snow and crabgrass. I did exactly as much as I had to for city ordinance and no more. My wife and I moved into a home in a nicer part of town, and we're apparently not high society enough for our neighbors. We've had constant disputes about our grass being long, by HOA standards, which are not a part of any HOA where we live. They've also explicitly told us to treat our yard for crabgrass, as it's infecting their yard with crabgrass. I'm well aware that is indeed the case, but why would I pay to kill something in my yard that happens naturally? I don't subscribe to yard worship, I guess. Recently, there's been quite a bit of snow where we live. Both my wife and I work fairly long hours, and couldn't be aid about shoveling snow after work, so long as we can get into our driveway. So recently, my neighbor's been sending us messages about how we're affecting our property values, etc. And then we received the following email last night from the neighbor next door. Email I received from my neighbor. So, I read the specific ordinances on our city, and found out that the only part of our property that's required to be shoveled per that ordinance is the front sidewalk directly in front of our house. You can see where this is going, I'm sure, but I decided to just shovel just the sidewalk and nothing else. Keeping in mind we have a fairly long driveway that's untouched by shovels. I can't wait for the ensuing messages. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new videos come out.